Okay, another week, question show, your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are watching any one of my videos, if you've got a question, whether it's about the video or just something that's just popped into your brain, go ahead, just type it into the YouTube comments and I will gather a bunch of them up and answer them right here. As always, shorter questions are better and uh, let's get into it. Liam.edu, can dark matter black holes exist? That's actually kind of like two questions, right? Like one is like, can dark matter fall into black holes? And I think the answer is absolutely. The dark matter isn't affected by any other kind of way with regular matter except through gravity. So dark matter is absolutely attracted to black holes. If dark matter passes through the event horizon, then all paths lead to the singularity. So it's not coming back out. So it will add to the black hole. So, but the other sort of part of the question is, would you have a black hole that's made of dark matter? And I think the answer to that is, is no, right? That, that once you get within the event horizon of a black hole, you can't really distinguish what it is anymore, whether it's matter or antimatter or photons of light or, or dark matter, all of that material just becomes more dark matter within the event horizon. And this is one of the sort of this is one of the problems that Stephen Hawking has come up with with the information paradox, which is that if black holes do evaporate over time, then all that difference of what the material was when it went in is lost. The information about it is gone as it evaporates back out in the into the universe and the black hole disappears. So but dark matter can absolutely go into black holes and what happens inside? We still don't know. Jim Lobby what do we know about the magnetospheres of exoplanets and their importance for the habitability of exoplanets? Now, if I sort of know my sort of current state of the research right now, uh, there hasn't been magnetospheres around exoplanets discovered yet, right? So the magnetosphere, this is that, that magnetic shield that is around the Earth, and we really depend on it for our survival. We need that, that magnetic shield to protect us from the radiation coming from the Sun and the radiation coming from, from deep space. So, <clears throat> you know, are there magnetospheres around other planets? I mean, we see them around Jupiter and Saturn, so we would expect that they're all across the universe. If there's some kind of dynamo going on, then they're going to have a, a magnetosphere. Would they be necessary for life? I would say probably, right? That, that here on Earth, we would be irradiated without the magnetosphere. And maybe you could have life under the oceans or protected by ice or underground or something like that. But if you're going to be on the surface, you need to prevent that radiation exposure. Now, you could probably have life forms which are tougher to radiation. But big life forms like us, like radiation is bad. So you really would want that magnetosphere. Now, right now, I don't think there's any exoplanets that they've actually seen the magnetospheres, but I have seen a couple of presentations, and we actually reported on Universe Today about that, that this is something that astronomers are going to be looking for, and that you could actually see with the right kind of observations, you could see the magnetosphere interacting with the region around the planet around another star. So this is something that astronomers are absolutely planning to search for. And I think it's going to be one of those keys to determine if a world is habitable down the road. We're going to want to see if it's got that magnetosphere to protect the inhabitants on it. JF, what's your favorite science fiction book, TV show, and movie? What's your favorite non-science fiction books and documentaries? I got a bunch of favorites uh, off the top of my head on TV. I really love The Expanse and um, man, what else have we been watching that we really liked? Uh, watched a bunch of stuff. Preacher, um, Game of Thrones, obviously. What? Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty, of course. We love Rick and Morty. Can I forget that? <laughs> um, uh, movies, uh, I really loved Arrival. I like um, Her and uh, uh, Ex Machina, which was great, sort of take on artificial intelligence. Books, I haven't been reading a lot of books. I read Ready Player One, a little too nostalgic for me. Uh, I liked uh, The Martian, of course. But I want to throw this back to you folks. Again, we got some great suggestions on YouTube channels to go see. So tell me your books, movies, and TV shows. Let's find some stuff that we haven't seen, read, watched and let's sort of build our collective libraries as if we need a bigger to-do list of things to watch, see, 
Uh, and while we're at it, what are your favorite video games? Let me know, and we'll put those all in the comments too. All right, thanks. Mr. Aces. I have a cousin who's a flat earther, so maybe could you help me shut them up? What one undeniable fact proves that the earth is spherical and not a flat infinite plane? You might have noticed that I have never covered that subject on this channel. And the reason is because it is ridiculous. Like it's literally not even worth explaining to a person. So if a person was like, you know, I think the earth is flat, my, I just like my eyes roll and I look for something to do on my phone, right? I do not care. There, there is no argument based in reality. There's no interest in, in evidence, in reason, in science. They're literally looking to use this theory to justify some preconceived notion about the universe. You know, like they really feel like it's about that there's, what is it? There's a, there's a bunch of, there's an elephant, there's elephants and they are on this big turtle or something. I don't know. Anyway. It's turtles all the way down. It's turtles all the way down. But if I... <sighs> So I will never do this, and I promise you right now, everybody watching, this is the only time I will ever talk about it, is in this exact moment right now. That's it. So, uh, but if I had to give them two things to think about. Number one, you can take a flight from Auckland, New Zealand to Buenos Aires, Argentina, which pretty much goes through the Southern Hemisphere, and it takes about 11 and a half hours, which is impossible on the flat Earth. Uh, two, when you're in the northern hemisphere and you look up in the night sky, you can see Polaris as the North Star and the, you know, the stars rotate around, which obviously is the Earth rotating. And when you're in the southern hemisphere and you look up, you see a different pole star, different set of constellations that the stars are all going around. So there's those two pieces of evidence that I think are just like open and shut. And then there's like a thousand more. So man, just like, don't even get it, like seriously, if you have a cousin that is like a moon hoaxer or a flat earther, they're probably trolling you, because seriously, they do not believe this. But, uh, so I just ignore them. Don't worry about it. This, this fascination with space and astronomy, it's not for them. They've got other things to do, other channels to go in, they can talk about it all they like and freak themselves out about Nibiru. This is not the place for them. Starship Enterprise. Hello, Mr. Kane. Love the vids, especially the question and answer ones. I know you're a big fan of these too. I was just wondering how long does it take you to make these videos? You and your wife must either be extremely proficient or have endless patience. How long does it take us to do the QAs? You're seeing this off the top of my head. So we pretty much don't do any other takes. I pretty much go through this. The whole QA episode is one take. I'll make a, like one or two takes where I'm like, eh, I don't like how I answer that and I'll sort of switch gears and do another answer. But most of the time it's literally stream of consciousness. And the thing is, is that these Q&A episodes, they're off the top of my head. The other episodes, the other Guide to Space episodes, those are read from a teleprompter. And that's why I kind of sound different in the two ones because I'm still trying to get to have the same presentation style between the two, but, but that's how we do it. Um, so, uh, it is a lot of pride. I mean, I have a massive amount of knowledge, but I've just been doing this for so long and talking about this stuff so much that it's just, it's just practice, practice, practice. Mike Doman. Here's a question. We get a couple of tons worth of meteors falling into the atmosphere per day, and we obviously get a bunch of energy from the sun. But on the other hand, the Earth is also radiating heat and losing some of its atmosphere. So is the net mass energy of the Earth increasing or decreasing? That is a really great question. And I did a bunch of researching before I went into the answer for this. And in fact, the numbers are almost the same. So as I mentioned, there are, you know, thousands of tons of debris that come into the Earth's atmosphere from meteorites and meteors and things like that, and particles from the sun. And at the same time, the Earth's atmosphere is kind of slowly escaping into space. And actually, the numbers between those two are actually really close to each other. Brian Koberlein did a great article, and we'll put a link to it in the uh, in the comments where he sort of runs the numbers, but it's sort of like, it depends on the scenario of how much atmosphere is, is escaping the Earth. But if you kind of run it one way, the Earth is getting more massive. And if you run it a different way, the Earth is getting less massive. So in general though, the mass of the Earth kind of stays the same, swapping dirt and metal for atmosphere. But don't worry, it's not a lot. And over the course of the billions of years that the Earth is gonna be around, it won't make that much of a difference. 
Lucid Moses. Your idea of the laser grid, are you expecting them to be floating or on planets, moons, generic big rocks, for the Jupiter and beyond area where solar is so meek, what kind of power are you thinking? I went into this pretty quickly in the last QA, so I thought I'd explain this a little, in a little more detail. So the idea of this laser array kind of works like this. S solar sails are, you know, a way to move around the solar system. And you can, of course, use the light from the sun to move your solar sail. The photons from the sun hit the solar sail, bounce off, and, and the solar sail moves through space. But the other possibility is that you can shoot a laser, a targeted laser, directly at the solar sail and impart photons exactly where you want them and accelerate your laser. You accelerate the laser in, you accelerate the solar sail in one direction and you raise its orbit, but you can also in the opposite direction, you can hit the solar sail in the opposite direction and you will lower its orbit. And so, like rockets, you will be providing thrust to the sail and it will be going in and out of the solar system. You will need some kind of you know, solar array to charge up the batteries, to power the lasers. And the further out you go into space, the bigger the, the array of solar panels is going to be. And eventually you're going to need like solar concentrators, like, like big curved parabolic mirrors that take the light of the sun and concentrate it and put it into the solar panels. And that's how you charge them up. And so I can imagine this sort of far, far future where, you know, there are these lasers and some of them will be on asteroids, on, on other worlds. Others will just be free flowing. They'll just look at like satellites in space and they'll be able to turn and they'll fire their laser and give the spacecraft whatever boost that it requires. And you could take this idea even further, right? With the idea of the star shot, the breakthrough star shot, they're going to send these little spacecraft f between the stars and they're going to use the same propulsion method. But the problem is that when you get to the other side, there's no way to slow them down. So again, you can kind of imagine this future, we send these robotic factories the slow way on a much slower path to other star systems and they land on those star systems and they build a factory and what they build is a laser array that's going to break, like slow down spacecraft that have been sent to them. And so then you've got these laser arrays in our solar system and they shoot and they accelerate up some spacecraft that's going to go between the stars. And then on the other side, you've got the spacecraft that fires again. And as they come in, it decelerates them. And you've got a true, very quick method of transportation, both within solar systems and really between solar systems as well. It would just take a million years to set up the infrastructure across the entire galaxy to be able to do that. So uh, that's that's kind of the idea, and uh, I hope we get working on it. Anthony Bond. Hi Fraser, just like to say I'm a patron and a big fan of the universe today. I also have a question. Has the solar system finished forming? Will the rocks and ice surrounding it eventually clump together to form new planets? Do you think the gas giants will stay as they are? By and large, the solar system is done forming. It was finished forming really early on when the sun sort of formed out of this nebula and there was the, the rest of the sort of the protoplanetary disk around it. And then as the sun kicked into gear, it blew out with its solar winds all of the material that was left over. And so you just ended up, you know, <clears throat> imagine you've got like a, a, I don't know, like a rock covered in sand and you blow and the rock remains and all the sand is gone. And that's, and that's kind of what's left. And so that's what happened to the solar system. So all the material that could have formed other planets has been, has been pushed out of the solar system. So when you look at the amount of mass, say the mass of the Earth compared to everything else that's in its orbit, it's about a factor of a million, right? There's a million times more mass in the Earth than all of the asteroids. If you take all of the asteroids in the asteroid belt and you merge them together, you get an object with about 5% the mass of the moon. So there's just not a lot of material out there. Now, I'm sure if you went out and you gathered up all the Kuiper Belt objects and all the asteroids and everything in the Oort Cloud and everything out there that we don't even know about and put it together, you'd make something. But they're not going to continue coming together. It's just been so long. It's been billions of years. All of the big objects that are going to form are done. Metal Salmon. Love your show. Question for you, Fraser. Is it possible that we are assuming things like going faster than the speed of light and other impossible things are impossible based on flawed, limited logic? Absolutely. 
it's almost certain that our understanding of the universe is incomplete or wrong. But, but what else can you do, right? I mean, all we can do is, is understand our universe with the laws of physics as we understand them today and make our predictions. And some of our predictions are going to hold out, and other predictions are going to turn out being wrong, but that's literally all we can do. You know, how do we make uh, predictions about the universe, about laws that we don't understand, and concepts we can't even imagine? We can't. And so, right now, the way science works is we say, to the best of our understanding, you can't go faster than the speed of light. And then later on, someone goes, oh, I figured out a way that we can go faster than the speed of light. And everyone goes, oh, okay. Then what we thought before was wrong, and now here's how you can go faster than the speed of light. The great thing about scientists and science is that it changes its mind. It's ready and open for new evidence. And so, on the one hand, you can say the best of our knowledge today, but then as soon as new evidence comes along, you just change your position. Oh, what I believed before was incorrect. This is what I believe now is based on the new evidence. And I'll probably change my mind again when the evidence changes. And that's just how science works. So, so that's sort of the, the framework that we work with when we explain this stuff. Um, and there's no other way to do it without kind of going crazy, right? Like, if you try to imagine what is also possible if the impossible things were possible, I don't know. Kent Changer Nimagon T. <laughs> One of your favorite space themed board games, besides Race for the Galaxy. Good eye. I've got a copy of Race for the Galaxy that sits behind me on the shelf when I'm doing the weekly space hangout. So I like Race for the Galaxy. Uh, I don't play a lot of space based board, any board games really anymore, mostly because I'm lazy and I really like the way video games will set up the board, keep track of the score, and clean up the game when we're done. And uh, so that's kind of like the way I like to play my games now. And also the complexity, like I really enjoy video games like Europa Universalis or Civilization or Stellaris, uh, stuff that's very complicated and you just couldn't replicate with a board game. But I would love to hear what you guys think. Again, in the comments, this is going to be a great comment, I think we should turn this into a wiki. What board games do you love? So remember, we want to know what movies, TV shows, board games, video games, uh, books we should be reading. Uh, put it all in the comments. I would love to do it. All right. Well, that wraps up another question show. Thanks, everyone, to putting in your questions. I love this. Again, wherever you are on any video, just type in your question, and I will gather them up and answer them here. And we'll see you all next week. I guess by the time you see this video, I will have already seen the eclipse, but literally we're about to fly off and see the eclipse tomorrow, so I have no idea what we're about to see, and I will give you a report next week.